let me introduce you now, so because I know you have only about 20 minutes, and I want to make sure that um, anybody who comes in afterwards will just have to speak to me afterwards. But to the entire group, you'll note that you're all muted right now. The chat box is open, so if you have a question, you can send it to me. But uh, this is Eduardo, did I say Briceño? Briceño, yes. Briceño. Yep. Okay, great. So he's from originally from Caracas, Venezuela. He's very, very chill and is said to keep it very simple and easy. But basically, he leads Mindset Works, which is a, play, which is a place that helps people develop um, as motivated and effective learners. And he works with some of the best people in the world who are PhDs. Um, I first saw him on his uh, TED Talk, uh, which, by the way, amazing. It truly is a life-changing talk, uh, and I don't say that lightly. And of the 1.5 million viewers you've had in your TED Talk, uh, Eduardo, I'm probably responsible for half a million of them. <laughs> I've watched it so many times. So most of the people in this group are, are, are um, positive-minded people who believe they can do. And that's why I felt this would be a really, really good opportunity for us to sit and, and talk and, and really discuss this. So if you don't mind, do you mind if I take just a moment to introduce uh, the TED Talk, which everybody has hopefully seen at this point. But if not, I'm basically, basically going to say, when he speaks about the two zones that we're typically going to shuffle between or that real achievers shuffle between, which is learning and performance, that we as orthodontists, who have always been typically tops in our class, have been trained to be performance zone people. Perform, perform, perform. Um, many of us have inadvertently been in the learning zone. But um, I have a bunch of questions I want to ask you, because like you and I said, hopefully most people have seen the video at this point, and I don't need to rehash that. But I want to spend about 10 minutes just asking a few back and forth questions with you. And if it's okay with you, then open it up to them for about 10 minutes and then let you get on with your life as we thank you forever. If that's okay. Sounds good. I look forward to the conversation. Great. So you talked a bit about the fact that we need to do deliberate practice. Uh, not the kind of practice we just show up. And it reminds me when I was a kid that practice doesn't make perfect, but perfect Mac practice makes perfect. Um, and my question for you, since this is a management and leadership group, technically, we all know how to practice. We've all done it. We've gone out of the mouth and done things technically on models, on casts, with specific goals and specific aims to become better orthodontists. But how do we become better leaders or better managers by using the things you've talked about? Mm -hmm. Great. How do we, how do we uh, practice them? Great. So, uh... Great question. Uh, let me let me start by just giving like a high level, uh, putting in a high level of context that um, often there's this misconception that the way to get great at something is to work really hard and to spend a lot of time engaging in the activity, right? And um, and we actually experience that sometimes. Like if we're gonna learn to play tennis. Uh, we might just go out with some friends and hit some balls and and we will get better just by performing, just by trying to play a game. Um, because that tends to work okay when we're novices, when we are, uh, when, when we don't know much, there's so much we can learn that just by trying to do something, we can learn from it and start to get better. Uh, but we get the sense that the way to get better is by doing something. And what a lot of research shows, as you're alluding to, is that it actually leads to stagnation if we just try to perform to do something and just do it as well as we can because we're focusing on what we know how to do trying to do it as best as we can rather than focusing on what we don't know and what what we can do better um, so for example there's research that shows that gen if you look at general physicians um, they and the question is as they gain more experience over the years do they get better in as physicians um, and this particular research which is really fascinating from Harvard shows that uh, general physicians actually get worse over time as they gain experience they actually get worse uh, in most professions we actually just see a plateau we don't see people getting worse but for general physicians if they're just really stressed out always working always focused on just doing their job as best as they can uh, what happens is they're not getting better but they're also getting worse because first of all they are forgetting information that's relevant to infrequent diagnosis, in infrequent situations, things that they might have studied in school, but they don't encounter in their jobs, they forget. And the other thing is that they are not up to date with the newest technologies, the newest uh, 
practices. And so as a result of that, they actually get worse over time on average. This is not true of all physicians. Physicians that go out, you know, out of their way to read research and to learn about the newest things and to figure out how to get better at what they can get better at, those they continue to get always get better over time. Um, so to your question about leadership, um, if that's, so I think at a high level, it's important for us to figure out is getting better important to me because a reasonable choice is just to say i'm just going to, i'm i'm okay with the way i am my 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 competencies as they are and i'm just going to focus on executing right and doing my job as best as i can and that's a reasonable you know position if somebody chooses that uh, but we can also think about is is improvement important to me and if so in what areas and so say for example because the improvement takes deliberate, like being deliberate about improvement is important. And that's the overall message. Um, so if leadership is something that is improve, that is important to us, uh, then to your point is like, what are some strategies to get better as a leader? And in general, is, is to get better at something, we need to be interested in getting better at something. We need to be deliberate about getting better at something. And then we also need to know how do we get better at something, right? Because if we don't know how to get better at something, to your point, uh, we can't get better. So if we want to get better as leaders, then we need to figure out how do I actually get better as a leader? Uh, and there is a lot of you know, body of knowledge on that or on anything else one wants to get better at. Uh, there are a lot of books about leadership. There's a lot of, you know, we could go take classes, you know, courses online or in person about leadership. And there's a lot of different philosophies around leadership. And then we can learn about these frameworks, learn about these different perspectives and try things out, experiment, do things that are a little uncomfortable to us, see, see what effect that has. You know, is that working out for us? Are we making progress? Uh, and engage in reflection, which is really important for us to, to think about what am I, what's going well, what's not going so well, what could I be doing differently? And then try something differently and then reflect on how is that working? Is that, does that seem to be making me better or not? Should I try a different approach? So it's a, it's a, a little bit of a, a vague answer, but there's so much about leadership that, would one could learn that one has to seek out that knowledge and and try to see what works okay well in a group like this uh a lot of the things you talked about in the ted talk are are here we've got the low stress environment right you talked about in dental school for instance there's so much risk with doing something wrong right the grade you want to become an orthodontist and the wax up you did isn't very good they've created so much stress that if the grade is poor you don't have the ability to inspire mistakes and to grow because that's what you talked about. If I understood correctly, we want to be in an environment where we can make the mistakes uh, in the low stress situation. So a group like this, where we all sort of open up our, our cupboards, if you will, and share everything, it's sort of like that. And I think it works well. But the question I have is you talked about something with the typewriter, which caught my interest about how if every day you went and typed one thing or you focused on one thing, um, you know, you could get better and better over a long period of time, as opposed to just sitting down at a typewriter and just trying to type everything and never really going anywhere. So the question is, when you're a younger doctor, could be an orthodontist, could be a physician, doesn't matter. How, how do you recommend not drinking from the fire hose, if you will, mm -hmm. right? Because right now, if you look at, around this room right now, you've got people who've never really led, never really managed, never really marketed, uh, or have limited experience and want to learn, I want to learn how to market, I want to learn how to lead, I want to learn how to manage, I want to learn how to deal with HR issues. What advice would you give to relatively younger or lesser experienced clinicians about, you know, you should make those mistakes, but should we be focusing on one area at a time or should we be trying to grow everywhere and potentially suffer the problems like you talked about with the typewriter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think there's a lot of value to prioritizing and, and, and focusing on one or two or three things instead of trying to do everything at once. Um, I, there's, um, there's also value in engaging in this periodically as a habit. Uh, it doesn't have to take like a lot of time each time that you're reflecting or figuring out what to do differently, but to do it regularly and as a habit uh, is more powerful than trying to do it for a lot of time because we're busy, we have a lot of patients to see. Um, and a way to create a low stakes environment is what you have here, right? Which is connecting with peers uh, in, in, in an environment where if you take a risk, you 
you talk about something you don't know, you ask a question, uh, you make a mistake is not going to, you know, to lead to to high stakes uh, mistake where you know a patient is going to die or or you're going to lose, you know, a lot of business. Uh, so so having this space for learning. Uh, to connect with peers and to brainstorm and to run each other uh, ideas by each other and, and support each other is a great way to do that. Uh, in in um, in technical skills, like for example, surgeons uh, for young surgeons uh, to become better, one way that they or, or pilots also one way that they lower the stakes while performing is to have a master next to them uh, who can take over when they're doing something or they're starting to do it wrong, doing a surgery or a flight. Uh, so that's one way that uh, people can lower mistakes in a high stakes situation. Uh, but just, I think, being mindful about when is challenging myself with what I don't know okay? And when do I want to do that to improve? And when do I want to focus on what I know well and minimize mistakes? Because the stakes are high and I making mistakes is very costly. So being mindful about that distinction is also one way to create the space for us to challenge ourselves. How do we, so the interesting thing about our particular profession is that here you have all these people who went to basically grade 23 right? That's how far you go through school. And we're generally working with and employing people who finished after grade 12, maybe 13 or 14, who don't necessarily have the same educational background or same drive to learn. Mm -hmm. How do you manage an environment where you have people who are, you know, by nature of self-selection, not as driven to learn, maybe they're vested in their personal growth within your practice, but how do you how do you create that interface between two very different types of, right? Because I can sit here with all of my peers and say, let's focus today on learning and we can all do it together. But I don't think I could take all of their assistance and all of us and do it at the same level. How do you, is there a different technique yeah. for doing it? Because I assume you can't motivate others. Well, so, so here's some thoughts. Uh, first, the, um, Techniques to give and receive feedback can be really powerful to create a learning oriented workplace. Um, and we find that when, so, so you, I think you wanna get to a place where the culture in your office is a learning oriented culture where people want to grow. They wanna give and receive feedback. And the way that people get to do that is when the people around them are learners and are engaging in those behaviors. And when people engage in those behaviors, their social status increases. Uh, so ideally, you know, those early hires that you hire uh, is not that, you know, if you want to create a learning oriented culture, the prior skills are not important. So if they only went to, you know, certain to, to 12th grade because of whatever life situation, maybe they had kids and, you know, they made mistakes or, or whatever. Now they matured and they are, they want to improve themselves. They have goals. Um, I think you can select for that. Uh, and, and be mindful of both the skills they need, but also how hungry are they for learning and for developing themselves and what questions do they have uh, and what goals do they have in the future. Um, and those early hires and, and developing that kind of giving and receiving feedback, modeling being a learner yourself so that you're, they're not seeing you as a know-it-all, but as somebody who wants to continue to develop and get feedback from them as well. Um, then kind of developing that culture, which is an art, not just a science. Uh, I, I do think you can get to that learning oriented culture in a workplace, but it does need uh, an element of selection an element, element of being mod role modeling learning. Cause sometimes then we think of ourselves as we're so educated, we know everything. And then we model no, no, being knowers and, and, and having all the answers rather than having questions. And then they're gonna emulate us if we do that. Um, so being mindful about how do we create a learning oriented culture is something that can be done deliberately. Do you, um, I know your company that you work with, do you do training with professionals like us? Do you do workshops? Um, and just so everybody here knows, I've never asked you this. It's not like we have some ulterior motive of me trying to talk people into this, but this is the kind of stuff I've done my whole career. I find people like yourself who are experts and I, I want to learn what I can. Do you do any sort of training for teams like ours? Do you do training for groups like ours? I, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but if we really wanted to become 
better leaders, better managers, being able to be better, because what you talk about is how to be better in all parts of your life, to be a better father, to be a better at sports, to be everything. Are there courses that we can go to? Are there places we can get trained in how to do this better, how to be more mindful at it? Yeah. So we, we do trainings, uh, usually it's in companies for corporate leaders or for pro professionals in companies. So yes, we do trainings for groups like this. Uh, and it is trainings about how to create a learning oriented culture, or how to create improvement, continuous improvement, rather than specifically how do I become, you know, a leader or a better designer or better X, Y, Z. Uh, but if you wanted to learn more about this, I think a great book uh, that I would highly recommend uh, is uh, Peak by Anders Ericsson. It's a fantastic book. Uh, another book that is, I think, really relevant to entrepreneurship and having your own business is The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. Uh, it's just it's a great, great uh, approach to, these are all books about how do I improve, right? If I, if I can understand that I can improve, then how can I, how can I actually, what steps do I take to improve? Um, and so those are some, some ways to, to get started on that. Okay. Um, I know we just have a couple of minutes left, but does anybody here have any questions you'd like to ask? I see there's, um, uh, is it, I see it says, could you please talk about your personal time management system? In other words, mm -hmm. how do we find time to be in the learning zone when life really yeah. gets yeah, life is so busy and I struggle with, you know, pressures to be in the performance zone for sure. Here's some of the things I do. First, uh, my, the first, another great book is The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg is like how, how do we design our habits, which drive so much of our behavior. Uh, so my, my morning habit is my most important habit. What I, whatever I do after I wake up, there's a series of things I do, includes like, you know, drinking a, a smoothie that I made in the weekend, and it, it includes meditating, and includes uh, at the end, when I start, like at the end of it, uh, I set my three top priorities for the day. And so that's, that's important for me to focus on what I deem most important for that day. Uh, so that's one thing I do. Something else I do is I find there's a lot of content that I want to consume, whether it's articles or videos. Um, and what I do is I have systems to put that article or video link in a queue so that at times where I can watch that while doing something else, I can learn from those things. And so for articles, I use this uh, app called Pocket. Uh, it's a mobile app that is also a website. And I just... I just literally uh, click a button and it adds the article into this thing. And then I can read the article in the app, but I, it can also read it to me. So while I'm driving, while I'm running, while I'm swimming, I'm listening to articles that I've identified or I've, I've thought I could learn a lot from. Um, and I have similarly a cue for videos. And when I have lunch, most of the time that I have lunch, I, I eat while watching these videos. Uh, and I learn a ton from, you know, learning from thought leaders out there about what they think about leadership or anything else I'm interested in. Um, and, and I do that while I'm doing these things that don't require a lot of conscious thought. Uh, I consume the content while doing those things. Right. I, I know you said you give us 20 minutes and you've been here for 21 minutes. So I want to thank you for your time. Um, at some point down the road, I'm going to touch base with you. I know you do corporate training, but we're going to be having an annual meeting. Um, and I may touch base with you if you don't mind about maybe hiring you to do a little something with us down the road because you're just amazing. And I think you're thinking outside the box relative to what we do on a regular basis. Um, someone asked about the name of the app. Is it called Pocket? Yeah, it's called Pocket. The, the website is getpocket.com. And for the videos, I use a self man uh, This is another thing that I use for actually time management is Asana. And I wrote it here as A-S-A-N-A. -A -A. It's a fantastic task management application um, that is just, it, it's a way to, to list what I need to do and be able to prioritize it and organize it. And so one of those lists is, is for videos and I can prioritize them. Um, but uh, this also reminds me of another great book uh, for self-management, uh, which is called Getting Things Done by David Allen. Uh, and that's a fantastic system to manage oneself and manage one's time. Uh, 
And so also finally on that kind of time management and self-management uh, topic, I would also recommend a book called um, Your Brain at Work by David Rock. Your Brain at Work? Yeah. Okay, great. It's about how your brain works and how we can m better manage our brains and ourselves. Okay. Uh, well, I really want to thank you on behalf of everybody here. Sure. I, I always wish I had more time with folks like you, but I respect how busy you are. Um, I'll certainly stay in touch if you don't mind on behalf of the sure. Everybody, this has been recorded so far, so this will be uploaded to Vimeo tomorrow. I would say as we say goodbye to you, everybody else can stay here for just a little bit. We can sort of uh, debrief a little bit about what you just talked about. And I really, from the bottom of my heart, I just want to say thank you very much from all of us. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Glenn, for what you do and for, for you to, to support each other. And as you speak, if uh, anything comes up in terms of feedback for me of what I could have done better, I would be interested in getting that from you later, Glenn. So, uh, all right. I will certainly uh, touch base with you afterwards. So thank you so much. Great. And thank okay. you on behalf of all of us. Take care. Thanks. All right. Take care. Um, so I hope I'm going to unmute everybody, if you don't mind. Bear with me for a second. Um, can everybody hear me OK? What'd you think? Pretty good? Yes. And yes, Classic Edition is on the point. Whose kid is that? As in yes, Classic is on the point. It's Ned. Shh. That's guys. Is he gone? I, I just muted her. I, you just got muted. Sorry. <laughs> um, some feedback, everybody, because A, we owe it to Eduardo to give him some feedback, and B, I'd love to learn what your thoughts were. A lot of good books to read. Yeah, I agree with you. Yes, hi, Liam. Hello. <laughs> um, did you find him useful at all? Did you find the information he gave helpful in any way? I was a little late to the game, so I think I missed a lot of the a lot of the, the initial discussion. Um, but time management is something that is a struggle to everybody, I'm assuming, at least for me. Um, I know I use that ink and bolt planner and try to schedule my time and prioritize it. Um, but it's always a struggle. I mean, there's some days you just, it's hard to get things done. You're just not feeling up to it, not have the energy or the drive to get it done. But um, Time management is, is absolutely important in, in anything we do, especially leadership. Well, the, the, the thing I wanted to bring up here, and I really would like to brainstorm it with all of you because it's a challenge I face, is what I asked him. I don't think he understands the education level for most of the people we employ. I don't think he necessarily recognizes that here you have all these people who've gone to one extreme by going to school for 25 years. And you know, it's one thing for us to all get in the learning zone, but is it, what tricks do any of you use to help your team learn new, new policies, new systems, new approaches? New, uh, what are some of the things you all are doing to make this happen in your offices? Okay, cut you off again. I feel like I'm on that sports talk show where the guy who loses gets muted. <laughs> Um, hey, Glenn, I don't I know think, if you well, can hear me. Who, who's talking? It, uh, it was Dima. Hi, Dima. Hi, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't have my picture up, because believe it or not, I still haven't figured out how to turn the camera on my laptop. But uh, <laughs> so anyhow, um, I feel like something that uh, helps a lot trying uh, to teach my staff and my group is wonderful, but I just feel repetition you have to keep on repeating things more than once until they finally get it and apply the system and not to give up on that i feel this is something that we all struggle with sometimes but i do feel being patient um with uh, with trying to keep on top of it and repeating things till they apply the system and not give up on it okay no, it, it sounds fair. Uh, I think the question that Andre asked is the most challenging. And then just as a quick aside, I would love to have had more time with Eduardo. I don't think I, I don't think we had the ability to give him the time that he would need. He's kind of like a 1972 Cadillac Eldorado. 
he takes, you know, probably 20, 30 minutes to really warm up. And then once he gets going, you can't stop him. But unfortunately, you're talking to a guy who's a double engineering MBA from Stanford, who's on the international lecture circuit and only works with Fortune 500 companies. I was thrilled to get him for 20 minutes um, because I figured any little interaction would be better than none. Um, just as a quick aside, usually I'll try to get people for longer than 20 minutes. And there's a gentleman I'm trying to get right now. Um, his name is Joe Hirsch. He actually happens to be a rabbi, but he just wrote a book called Feed Forward that's coming out shortly. And we've been talking about getting him in for a conference. And what he, his whole concept is he followed Fortune 500 leaders around and learned how to give effective feedback to employees. Right? How do we give feedback? without pissing them off, without getting them angry. Um, and so that, so that can motivate them, which sort of dovetails this topic. So I'm trying to bring with speakers who are not involved in dentistry, because we can get that anywhere. I'm trying to get us people who are helping us think outside the box. And that's what's always helped me in my career. So changing back now, I want to go back to the topic at hand. We talked about repetition. I know what my answer is, but I'm tired of hearing myself talk. Tell me, in your practices, what time do you devote, like Andre asked, to learning zones? How do you, I, I know you can find time for yourselves, right? Like that's easy, right? Um, but how do, you, how do we find time? What's an effective strategy to do this with our team so that the problems we're facing in our office over and over again, we can actually effectively accomplish? I do my weekly team meeting from eight to nine every Wednesday morning. I do a quarterly meeting for half a day. I do a, a yearly meeting for a full day. Um, you know, that's how I, I do my stuff. Uh, and of course we do morning meetings, but that's not really for problem solving. What are you all doing that might be different? I'm right now I'm in this, <laughs> I, I'm kind of in a, a, a situation where I'm taking over practice. The staff's been there 20 plus years and it's very difficult to hear him say, create that learning environment. That That's at home. Kind of what I'm trying to promote right now. But what I'm, my attempt at, at to tackle this right now is every, every two weeks, I have an hour and a half, two hours where I shut the office down midday. And, you know, it's on a topic, it's on a different system because there's just so many systems, but it's, I kind of feel like they, their repetition is so ingrained after 20 years and this, goes this is a whole new issue i think that it's I'm, I'm seeing it's more of a challenge to break that and and they you know i'm trying i'm starting to finally get the sense that they're just kind of grin grinning and we're not around and um they're not really wanting to learn they act like they want to learn but I, so i think that's just a whole separate issue of me needing to learn there, but definitely a challenge i don't know if my way is effective but it seems like the most reasonable thing right now. But Jerry, question for you on your topic. Right now, this second, if you could take one thing and change it about their, the practice or the way they're dealing with it, what would it be? Right now, one thing. I would like them to take things into their hands. And so I'm not the only person doing things. You know, I need a leader. Okay. Have you considered, and I'd love to hear if anybody else, did, from a show of hands, just raise your hand. Yeah. Um, and I can't see four of you, but from those I can see, how many of you took over an existing practice? So everybody else, raise your hands if you started your own practice. Okay. Um, so I might be one of the few people who's actually taken over an existing practice twice. I did it once when I was a restorative dentist, and I did it once as an orthodontist. Um, it's the exact same difference. It's no different one way or the other. And the practice I took over both times, the staff was informed the day I took over. There was no discussion ahead of time. So I walked in and told, hey, by the way, this is your new boss. I sold the practice this morning. Uh, so you can kind of guess what that's like. Um, I think it's, an, I will just offer my advice to everybody in the room and it just comes from this stuff over here that, you know, um, you know, gives me some degree of, of credibility on some level. Be who you are. And, and I, this is how I hold myself in the world of um, referrals as well. 
and it's hurt me because I'm from the Northeast. I tend to talk really quickly um, and I scare people. Um, but at the end of the day, you look at the most successful people you know, and they'll all hold the same thing in common. Be authentic to who you are when you're around your team and around referring doctors and it, uh, among us here, be who you are. Don't be apologetic for who you are, uh, especially if you're a moral and honest person. And this applies to all of you as you build your teams. Um, define your vision very clearly of what you want and don't tolerate people who don't go along with that vision. Because at the end of the day, and this, this was really hard for me and it's hard for me still today. My name is on the building. My name is on the bank loan. And we tend to live in a world of fear, particularly at your stages, where, oh my God, if I lose my treatment coordinator, I'm dead. If I lose that assistant, I'm dead. I better not piss them off because if I do, I'll never be able to replace them. And I want you to realize that every person in the office, including us, are replaceable. So you won't realize the impact your practice has until you get out the people who you need to get out. And I've known dentists who bought practices and had six employees and lost all six. I once practiced as the only person in the office. It was, there was illness involved. I didn't like throw everybody out. But I was the only one with no front desk, no assistant, and no hygienist in the office one day. And anybody who knows me knows that the attitude is, it'll always work out. It's gonna be fine. And so I would say for, for you, Jerry, and I'd love feedback from anybody else who's been there, don't be afraid to implement your vision. Do it kindly, do it nicely, do it with love, and make it clear to every person on your team that if they called you at 2 a.m. with a problem, you'd be there for them. You have to authentically care about every person on your team as if they're a part of your family. Now, I know that when we're an orthopreneur's regular, and in the old 101, you hear a lot of really, really strong language being thrown around about, oh, I don't have any, I don't have any purpose for a person who doesn't meet my goals. I, nobody's important, I can throw them out. At the end of the day, that's all BS. I don't know any successful practice where people don't genuinely care about their team members. Now, you, that doesn't mean to go out drinking with them and get drunk, but what it does mean is let them know that you really care about them. Doesn't mean you have to hug them and get in trouble for that, you know, but let them know that you care about them. If you look at the most successful people and you look around at people like Cole Johnson, right, who we've all seen, if you look at, you know, um, oh gosh, Sa Salen, you know, there's all these people I can throw out their name of Kyle, Fagula, um, all the people that you know are authentically who they are. And I have no doubt that's who they are around their teams. So don't be afraid to be who you are, be honest, give feedback. And that's why I like my 90 day um, feedback because it gives you a chance to check in with them. Does anybody have any suggestions for Jerry or anything that you sort of add on to that? Was, was that enough to help you? That, yeah, that's great. And that's kind of what I've been doing the first four months. I've been kind of establishing that, that, you know, authenticity. And I think they really believe in, you know, my why and why I'm doing this and, you know, I'm coming from the heart and it's altruistic, but now I'm, I'm getting to the point where I, I, I kind of need more and it's, it's, you know, it's, you know, I, I think I'm making the right moves. It's just, and I, as I'm saying this, I just know the one one person, and I feel like she's just so strong behind the scenes. And again, I think it's a whole separate HR issue where I just need to um, bond. They're so close knit, though. I'm kind of like, okay, if I get rid of the one, the whole the whole tower is going to crumble down. So it's and that's, and that's a fear mentality. Yeah. I'm telling you, you yeah. Know, everybody here, if there's one lesson you can get, I'm telling you, um, you don't have a lot of this yet, and. You know, how do you get experience by making bad decisions? Um, you know, but the more decisions you make, the more experience you get. And I'm telling you, don't go from a poor mentality ever. If you have somebody in your office who you think has a cancer, get rid of them immediately. Um, if you lose the rest of your team, you lose the rest of your team. It's not a big deal. Um, I'm going through change in my office right now. Someone wasn't there today. Not one patient asked where they were. We tend to overvalue 
the people in our lives who are our ancillary players. We still have to care about them. But if someone's a cancer, what helped me, um, Jerry, you have kids? I don't. Are you married? No. Oh, then go out and party. Forget all of it. <laughs> but the part, the part that made a difference for me is every time I saw a cancer in my office, I thought of my wife and my kids and the impact that these people were having on my family. And I had no problem of saying, you know what? I don't want to fire them. I don't want to get rid of them. It's going to make life tough. But I've got a wife and I've got kids who rely on me. So I have no problem doing this. I just have to keep saying that to myself as I was sort of was fired by my wife and my kids. You're fired. My, and it never gets easier to this day. 25 years later, I hate firing people. Um, but you just got to stay on it. Um, you're blessed that you have no family right now to worry about because you can focus on you and your team. Because let me tell you, it gets way more complicated later on. I could imagine. Um, but again, just you have to put credit in the bank also. And I think all of you who have, who have if you can hold up, how many team members do you have on your team right now? Each of you. I'm just looking. I see six. Peace from Caroline. Um, <laughs> eight. Six. Dr. Shaw, I think, has three. Ten. And I can't see the other people, but okay. So you have all varying numbers and five up there for Darren. So you all have varying numbers and you can all attest to the fact that everybody plays a vital role in your office. But the key is, and I'd love your feedback, is I think it's about also credit in the bank. You can ask for more when you've given more. So yeah, I see 14, four, nine. Um, if, if you continuously put in, take them out to lunch spontaneously. Just tell me, hey guys, we're going to lunch today. Take them somewhere, do something, put credit in the bank. So when you ask for something back, you're not being, you're not treating them like, you know, if you didn't put money in, you can't take any out. So give and give and give and keep giving and give and give and love. So that when you ask for something and there's a cancer, you can look them in the eye and say, hey, time out here. What gives? Have I not been true? Have I not been honest? Have I not given to you? Why are you doing what you're doing? And you'll find probably 50% of the time they have no idea they're even doing it. So, um, Andre asked, I need some advice. I have a front desk who's a nice person, but not the best on the phone. Yeah, I'm on the brain. She's been with me for 10 months. I treat her daughter. Da, da, da. I want to fire her and hesitant. So Andre, um, and again, uh, anybody with experience, please fill in. When I was in my twenties and Dr. Shaw, you've heard me say this a thousand times. When I was in my twenties, I started hearing that little voice in my head, you know, the one that says, kill, kill. Um, now, the, 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 voice, the voice in my head that would say, don't do that. This is a mistake. You know, um, don't let your wife hold your beer and go do that stupid thing because you're going to get hurt. It's that voice that tells you, I never listened. Then my 30s came along. What is that? Is that a kid or a dog? It's your dog. So... In your 30s, you start to hear that voice more and you start listening. And when you hit your 40s, you know that voice is always right, always. So Andre, the first thing I'm gonna to say to you is, if you say, I want to fire her, but I'm hesitant, if that voice in your head is telling you to let someone go, it's right. Don't second guess it. There's a consultant I once saw who said, underachievers tease us with their potential. And it's so true. Because we try to keep looking on the good side. Oh, but she does this well. She does, oh, she's nice. Oh, I treat her husband. All of these problems can be solved. If she's not right for your office, you gotta get rid of her because it's not fair to her. Any advice from anybody here? Please, somebody. I think I just recently had to let go an assistant. And I know every situation is different, but I had talks with her over and over again. And basically what it came down to is I made clear expectations of what I needed her to do. And I said, if you can't, if you cannot do this, if you cannot fulfill this role that I need fulfilled, and I have a small staff, so everybody does play a vital role. I said, if you can't, and now I want you to be honest with me, we need to, I need to find somebody who can. And I, and I basically let it be her own choice that she couldn't, she couldn't do what I needed to have done. Um, so, you know, being really clear with your expectations, and I know Cole Johnson, if anyone went to the MPS forum, you know, talked about immediate 
constructive criticism. It, it has to be immediate. It can't be delayed. It has to, to be right then and there when the incident happens so that it's on their mind. Doug, if I can interrupt for just a quick second. Yeah. I yeah. Just, who here saw Cole speak at MKS? I just, I want to caution everybody a little bit about what he was talking about. Cole's a great guy, but he's not a, a psychiatrist. He's not a psychologist. He's not an HR person. I want to warn everybody, be a little careful with his advice of, of speaking right there and then or that day or that night. Um, it's not necessarily the right choice. Um, I think you have to think things through sometimes and you have to have a plan because what happens if they don't follow the advice that you were given? You find yourself in a very tricky situation. So again, I think it was a good thing he mentioned, but you have to be very careful because you can get burned. And my question, sorry, Dr. Shaw. I was just gonna say, I agree. I mean, I think it's case dependent. If it's something small as far as correct me, something clinically or, you know, I think that, that's okay, but if it's something where that needs discussion and you don't want to criticize a staff member in front of anybody or in right. front of patients, because I think that's wrong, um, you know, those conversations need to happen to the side. But, but the question I want to ask everybody here, because this is, I know the answer that I would give, but it's a good learning experience for all of you. You've got an employee, like Andre said, who they can't, who they know in their heart is the wrong person and they want to fire them. From a show of hands, I'll ask, I'll ask two choices, and then I want you to raise your hand, like one or two. Choice number one, you know they're wrong, you start interviewing secretly, you find somebody, you let them go so the new person can come in, is choice one. Choice two is I want to be honest and fair, and I want to let you go, and then I'm going to start looking for somebody because I'm not going to cheat and look behind your back. Do you choose number one or choice number two? Hold up your, I, I can't see everybody. Caroline, you have to choose. I don't know. You're, you're an owner of a business. I say, okay, I see ones, twos. I feel like I'm watching the Brady Bunch. Caroline, is that a one and a half? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so, and I see Andre at a one. Do you I think know? it depends on your situation. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you, I did a year program at the University of Washington Graduate Business School. They had in some of the world's best industrial psychologists. I said in front of the group, I don't feel comfortable uh, hiring behind somebody's back. I think it's duplicitous. I think it goes against everything I believe in from an honesty and morality. She looked me in the eye and said, then you shouldn't be a business owner, Glenn. You should be a teacher. And so, you know, it, it, it's, at now, um, I got to be honest, I still fire and then look. But I, I create a relationship with people on trust to where I say to them, look, um, can you be here for a week? Can you be here for two weeks? Or I just fire them and give them severance, which I always give, by the way. I always give severance. If someone hasn't had a malicious, I said, Chad, hold up two fingers for two weeks. Yeah. I'll usually give one or two weeks, depending upon how long they've been with me, because they rely on us to pay their bills. And I'm not going to take advantage of that. But has anybody here had an experience or a suggestion about well, Andre? Does he hire first or does he hire after? Does he fire? Which, what does he do first? I got to be honest. Uh, when I was, when I had, a, I have a large staff, so I can absorb the, uh, the the letting go of one person right away. But if if I had a staff of four or five or six, I'd probably hire. I'd probably look for somebody behind their back first. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's hard to absorb people when you don't have a, somebody can step in. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, 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 and if you do that and you have a small staff, the problem you run into is now you're, gonna, you're in a rush to hire, and that's the last thing you want to yeah. do. I've made some mistakes doing that, too, where you rush to hire, and it's, it just it, it continues the tumult for another three, four, six months, whatever. Yeah, you know, the worst part, Dr. Sean knows what's going on in my life right now, but, you know, I bought this practice two years ago, and I've got five employees. Um, my team coordinator is pregnant and going out on maternity the day school lets out for summer. Like, is that better timing or what? My front desk, who's going to fill in for her, got pregnant and she's moving away with her husband. So now I'm trying to hire for my front desk to be trained to be a fill-in TC. 
And all the while, I got four and a half weeks till my treatment coordinator goes out on maternity. So now everybody here is probably kind of nervous, right? right. I don't lose a moment's sleep over it because it's going to work out. But at the end of the day, to your point, Chad, what happens? Do I take somebody who's a mediocre employee who's going to be my treatment coordinator in four and a half weeks? Right? It, you have I'm, to I'm fortunate enough that my wife is like my go-to all-around girl. She can fill in anywhere, so... Yeah, no. you're lucky there. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wait, hold on. I, I'll unmute you so we don't have to listen to an airplane or a dog. <laughs> I said I don't have one of those. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it depends what state you're in. There's no love, <laughs> I guess. I personally. <laughs> yeah. But, but again, I agree with what you said, Chad. Um, there are times, though, I don't even want to know what that animal is. Um, there are times where you have to hire somebody who's not your ideal. You have to, you just have to. And you hope that they have the honesty and the integrity and the skill, like the brains, to do what you need and hope it works. But has anybody here ever hired somebody that the day of the hiring they knew they just hired the wrong person? <laughs> yeah. How long did that last for you guys? <laughs> Three days. <laughs> oh. Okay. Nine months. <laughs> Nine months till yeah. the baby was born. Do what? Till the baby was born. Uh, <laughs> till she told me she wasn't the right fit and she left. Because <laughs> I'm a, a weenie. <laughs> I, I, I had somebody for one hour. One hour. <laughs> and if you put a wire into someone's mouth and you forget to tie it in and send them home, <laughs> that's usually. Yeah. That's uh, a usually a good sign that either brain or hand skill or both are not working well. So <laughs> the key to take away from all of this, and I think it's good to come full circle for him, is that what is that? <laughs> is somebody being strangled? <laughs> I can't find a quiet spot. It's seagulls. They're seagulls. Okay. I'm not near the beach. <laughs> mine, mine. Um, Just mute me. I'm, I'm, there you go. You're muted. Oh my god <laughs> um so the key, the key to, all is to recognize and again um from a show of hands here how many years have each of you owned your own practice in overall in life so chad nine eight six two caroline is the big goose egg she's starting a practice one for jerry the key to all of this, and those of you who've done it, thank you, I, I see you too, Darren, as six. Um, so the key is that you're gonna make mistakes, right? I mean, that's, when it comes back to what Eduardo was talking about, we're all gonna make mistakes. There's no right or wrong. Uh, there's varying levels of right and wrong in what we do. The question is, are you going to repeat the same mistakes over and over again, or are you going to learn from them? And try, and, and that's really the essence of what he's talking about is, how many of you have, and I've never done this, how many of you have ever hired the wrong person, fired them or let them go, and then sat down for 45 minutes to an hour to debrief why you made the wrong mistake? Right? We never do that. And that's exactly what he's talking about when he talks about the performance zone versus the learning zone. You just let somebody go. It was crystal clear they were the wrong person. How do we avoid that mistake again in the future in a low stress way? And so when I watched his TED talk, which if you've not seen, you really should, it's only like 11 minutes long. Um, it made me stop and think about everything I do. How do I debrief that? When I have a crappy day at the office, you know, we need to talk about it as a team and say, what made it a crappy day? How do we prevent this from happening again? You know, when it's a really good day, how come it was an awesome day? What do we need to do to make that right? You know, who are our best patients and who are they coming from? If we find that our top 10 favorite patients, eight of them came from Dr. Smith, then we need to spend more time going to Dr. Smith, but who really sits down and thinks about not the number of patients, but the quality of the patients, right? So I know that a lot of us love to look at the, the, the clinical side. We like to look at the dental side. We love to hear dental speakers because we're at home with that, we're comfortable with that. I'm trying to create an environment here for us where we get a lot of the non dentists to challenge us to start thinking differently than everybody else out there, where we're the ones debriefing at the end of the day, where we're the ones debriefing after we've let somebody go, 
um, so that we have the best team, the best patients, the best systems, the best policies, the best marketing. Um, so what other little t tidbits would anybody else like to throw in before we sign off for the night? Hey, Glenn, I've got one. Oh, please. Hey, Darren. Hey, so, so I know you, you, you hooked me on Patrick Lencioni's book about the, um, the perfect meeting. Death by and, meeting. And, yeah, yeah, death by meeting and a uh, great book. Awesome. I love the way that you're doing your meetings. I think that goes a long way with uh, page, uh, communication with the staff. He's also got another book that's called The Ideal Team Player. And in that book, he basically states that there's three qualities you should look for for an ideal employee or an associate. And that is to be humble, hungry, and smart. And so I think if you find that right person, even if it's, you know, the newest dental assistant, they have to be hungry. So they have to have that drive, that willingness to, to be better, to, you know, nobody wants to suck at what they do. So they have to want to be able to do better. Um, they have to have, they have to be humble, which means they have to be able to take criticism, you know, and, and be able to improve themselves. And then they have to be smart and whether that's smart in their job and their tasks, or more importantly, to be people smart, to be able to deal with people, deal with kids, deal with parents and those kind of things. So reading that book, I think I've really started to look at my team members to say, are these people humble, hungry, or smart, or if so, where are they in that, that three circle Venn diagram? You know, some are gonna be more hungry than others, some are gonna be smarter than others. But if you have somebody that is outside that circle in one of those things, and that person's probably not gonna work out, or you, or you may not be able to change that person. And so I don't know if you've read that, read that, that book too. But. I've not, has anybody but. else read that book? No, but I think that's the biggest challenge we all face is finding those people because they're hard to come by and, and a lot of the times the people who are, have all three of them aren't going to be with you long because they've got drive and they've got the smarts and they're going to move on but you know something that I at least for me when we're talking about replacing staff we're always hiring we're always looking for somebody because you never know when that that resume is going to come across your desk and and you need to snag that person. So, um, but but the meetings. I think the first thing you do, need to do with the meetings is it needs to be on the calendar. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. It needs to be on the calendar, and you need to have an agenda. There needs to be a topic. You need to have something planned to be discussed. Otherwise, these things never happen. By the way, uh, everybody should know that in my office, my weekly meeting is the first day I'm in the office in the first hour. So every, we, right now, I, I work in this office Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Wednesday morning, 8 a.m. is our meeting. So that we can start the meet. I hate starting my week going to be a patient right off the bat. It just seems like such an abrupt way to begin your week. So for me, I learned that what work was 8 a.m. Wednesday morning from 8 to 9, we do our weekly meeting. And we can really start the week on a positive vibe and we have an agenda. We go through things and it's worked really well for us. Um, has anybody here ever hired somebody not in the dental field because they saw great customer service? Has anybody ever hired them? Yes. How'd that work out? She is now going to be my office manager as my wife transitions out. She's great. She was a manager of a coach uh, purse store. She wanted something different from retail. How did you get her to come over? What did you do? She applied for. She applied to me. She applied to me, but she had no experience in uh, as a front desk, as answering phones to start because she wanted to get out of retail. And but she had no experience in medical dental at all. Now there's a famous consultant who recommends that we all have business cards made up, and the, you, you probably heard this right that you take the business card with you, and basically it says something along the lines of, "Thank you for the exceptional service. You're the kind of person I'm looking for in our practice." If you're interested in a job, please email me or call me at this number. Now, I know it sounds a little bit like, hey, you've got a beautiful face. You could be a model. You know, give me a call. Um, cheesy kind of creepy thing. But I think, you know, I've seen this. People say it works really well at restaurants, uh, in service industry, just to leave your call. Give them a card and say, look, I'm an orthodontist. Go look me up. I'm not a fly-by-night person. If you want to get out and get your foot into that field, I'd love to have you. And 
you know, if I ever make that card, I keep saying I want to, I'll certainly show it all to you. So, you know, maybe you do it. I also, and, and ladies of the group, uh, please don't get offended. But um, I was told by an old timer that the best employees he ever got, don't laugh, Dr. Shaw, um, the best employees he ever, I can't even say this now. Um, <laughs> He got his best employees at Hooters. Um, and the reason he did, and the reason he did, he said, because these are women who are hungry, they wanna make a living, and they're not going around naked. They're not, they could easily go to a strip club or some sort of thing, and they're not doing that. They're, they're working hard, and he said the most important thing about those women has nothing to do with them physically, it's that they put up with real demeaning BS all day long and they continue to do their job. That they're hungry enough to do their work when people are throwing innuendos at them, slapping them on the behind, uh, saying things to them all day, that they wanna get out of that industry, they wanna make a good living, and that they'll, do, they'll be the best customer service representatives of your office because when someone screams at them or mistreats them, they have the thick skin to deal with it and move on. And he said that the best employees he ever got were from Hooters because he knew that these were women who were many times single moms, wanted to make a living, were hungry, and really put up with a lot. And they were proven team players. And so, ladies, take it with a grain of salt. I'm just saying, um, I've never had the guts to tell my wife I was going to Hooters to recruit new members. Um, <laughs> and I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon. But I think there's a lesson to be learned that if you see somebody in a business who's really killing themselves to make good in bad situation and they're doing a good job of it, they might make a good employee, right? I've got a girl that used to work at Hooters and she is the most chill employee I have. I mean, she even, you know? Don't so talk about your wife that way, okay, Chad? <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> Joking aside, how did you? I'm afraid to find out. How did you find out she was at Hooters? Uh, she's got good wings. Uh, yeah. Uh, she, uh, I think she just told me. I, I don't know. Yeah. She's, <laughs> sure. um, I met but, some of her friends one night somehow. I'm not sure. <laughs> but at the end of the day, she turned out to be a pretty good employee. Yeah, she's great. She she put. I mean, I you know putting up with stuff. She has to put up with me. Uh, not that I'm slapping her on the ass or anything, but, uh, you know, she, she just, no highs, no lows, everything's really even keel. Okay. Yeah. So, um, it's something I think we can brainstorm down the road in terms of, you know, finding new employees. Cause I, I gotta be honest now that I'm searching and I, I know how to write an ad. I know how to interview. I'm getting very few decent applicants and I'm sure all of you are the same way. Uh, and it's very, very hard to find that ideal team member and many times you just have to compromise to some extent and do your best. I'll let my team, I'll let my team have a voice as to who's going to be, especially in the back, uh, as to who's going to be part of the team because if they don't get along with them, it doesn't matter how good they are. Um, it doesn't work usually. Does anybody, does anybody ever send the interviewee out to lunch um, with the rest of the team? Definitely. Say, Go to lunch, come yeah. back. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, works nice, doesn't it? Has, has anybody has anybody done any, has anybody done group interviews? I did. I did a uh, like thirty second, not thirty seconds. It was like five minutes. Like thirty people showed up. I, my whole team interviewed them all for five minutes each. Like, what do you call that? Like, fast dating or something? I don't know. <laughs> Called ortho interviews. It sucked. Don't do it. It was terrible. We got, no? the, we got the girl I fired in nine months, or she fired herself in nine months from that. From that? And, and the question was how to write a good ad. I, I guess I, did I post that on Orthopreneurs, my, my copy of my ad, or was that an Ortho 101? Yeah. I could have sworn that on Orthopreneurs at some point I posted a copy. Maybe it was in my other group that I'm in. Maybe it was dental, uh, I'm in another uh, group like ours. You posted I'll, I'll, it when I did. I'm sorry? Sorry, you posted it under a question I made back in like January or February when I was asking about hiring. Did, did it help you? Yes, thank you. Okay, you know, if I'll, I'll remember to post that again tomorrow in our group. Um, and any questions 
have, I, I'm the guy who spent a few hundred thousand dollars on consultants in my career. I had people come in, going back Andre about the phone, the scatterbrain, uh, you might want to hire a um, phone coach, which I did. And they recorded every phone call that came in was automatically recorded. And then it was sent to me as an MP3 through email. And then I could review it with the person on the phone, but they, they always had a choice to rip themselves apart first before I said a word. And if they hit all the points, I wouldn't say a word. But um, you could consider that if they've got the brains and the kindness and they just need to be better phone people, you can train that. That's a skill that can be, that's not something that's inherent. Um, and I, I hired people to teach me how to write an ad. And so um, I always say my name. I always tell them who they're going to be working for because every time they're going to tell you that, oh, good, I'm glad you saw it. They're going to tell you, um, I looked you up on Facebook. I looked you up on Google. Uh, and they want to know who you are to make sure you're not their current employer as well. So I'll try to post that tomorrow so I can remember. Um, yeah, I know, Andre, it's a lot of work to have to do that kind of stuff. Uh, but my adage is if it was easy, everybody would have it, right? And the tough stuff and the easy stuff are not necessarily the same stuff. So um, I don't know. It just takes, that's why we're all here at 730 working on this stuff. Anything else anybody else wants to talk about before we sign off? I always find these sorts of things really, really useful. You know, we're all online all the time. We don't get a chance to really talk about this and I always get a lot out of this and I hope that as time goes on, you all feel more comfortable taking a more of a leadership role because I try to keep the ball rolling, but I really love it when other people take command of these things. How many of you are gonna be at AAO? I'm flying out there tomorrow, so just, um, I'll put my cell phone number on the, uh, on the uh, Ortho RD. Uh, web Facebook page and if anybody wants to get a hold of me um, we're thinking Doug and I are, are taking a place uh, about a half mile away we're thinking of having a rave right Saturday night <laughs> yeah so Doug's already working on it he's got the music um, but if anybody's gonna be there look this. <laughs> hey, hey, you started it <laughs> I did not start that um, so anybody who's going to be there, please feel free to look me up. Um, I'd love to see you. It's kind of funny how we have this fraternity online, but none of us really knows each other. So uh, I'm, I'm in the process of putting together an annual meeting uh, for sometime next year, and I'll talk to all of you about that. Uh, my goal is to bring in people like Eduardo uh, to work with our teams and to work with us. Uh, and I really want to talk to you a little bit about it, but a lot of real close personal workshop stuff so that we can really walk out of it with some really good stuff. Uh, I know enough to know that I'm not the guy who should be leading those. So I'll certainly take some advice of areas you want to learn more about if you're interested in coming to it. So with that, um, I just wish you guys all a great weekend. Um, for those of you at AEO, look me up. And if there's anything you need at all, please always feel free to grab me. And I hope that this was useful for you all. So thank you, Brian. Thank you. My pleasure. Have a great night. You too.